Great, thank you. Um, welcome again, everyone. My name is Siadam Edmo. Uh, I'm Shoshone Bannock Nez Person Yakima, and I use she, her pronouns, um, and I work at the MRG Foundation. Um, MRG Foundation is um, a 44-year-old organization um, and who has been funding um, social, racial, economic, and environmental justice um, since, since we were founded in 1976, and um, primarily funding organizing and change work um, in communities across the Northwest. Um, and I'm particularly proud of the work that we have been doing around um, lifting up tribal communities um, since joining the foundation two years ago. Um, however, we've had a long history of doing this and I'm proud to continue that history. Um, we've funded um, restoration efforts of terminated tribes across the state, um, as well as nonprofits who um, like Columbia Riverkeeper, one of our partners on, on this campaign effort. Um, so um, that includes um, honoring tribal history and sovereignty as a part of the work that they do um, in the, the conservation and uh, environmental fields. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, and I'm going to um, hand it over to Robert Miller um, Robert is a professor of law at the Sandra Day O'Connor um, College of Law at Arizona State University. And um, he's gonna move us through a quick presentation, um, just laying the groundwork um, for our own understanding of how tribal sovereignty um, and the, the many layers of um, jurisdiction um, complicate the issue of water access. Um, for tribes and tribal communities. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Bob. And Bob, I think um, Jude Perez from our team is set to run the slides and um, just let them know when to advance them. Okay, Thanks. great. Thank you very much, Siadam. Hello, everyone. I'm glad, sorry that I was late. I was on another Zoom call. And as soon as we hang up, I have class that starts at 1.30. So this is all Zoom all day. I'm delighted that you're addressing these issues. Thank you, C. Autumn, for inviting me. So I have 15 minutes to give, teach you my 14-week Indian law class. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Jude. Next, hit it again, please. So this is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, folks. I'm assuming that you know almost nothing about Indian law and the status of Indian tribes. There are three governments in the United States as recognized by our constitution right here. Article one, section eight, clause three. You know this as the interstate commerce clause. Those of us who practice Indian law, we call this the Indian commerce clause. This is the only reference to tribes, express reference to tribes in the constitution, but it is enormously important. The United States Supreme Court has cited this provision, analyzed this provision of the constitution dozens of times in cases since 1789. Uh, next slide, please. And hit it again, please. Indian people are mentioned twice in the constitution as citizens of their own governments, literally recognized as not being citizens of the federal government or the state governments. Uh, next slide, please, Jude. Next slide, please. The 14th Amendment, the first, the, the, that provision we just looked at was amended and the slaves of the South were now recognized as full people and full citizens of the United States. But Indian peoples, as you will see, were still not. So even in 1868, our Congress, the, the law of the United States recognized tribal peoples as citizens of their tribal governments as recognized under what, Article One of the Constitution. Uh, hit it again, please, Jude. In 1884, the US Supreme Court said Indians were not US citizens. Uh, and, and then all Indians were finally made US citizens in 1924. Another one, Jude. Uh, this is an implied reference in the constitution to Indian tribes and to Indian nations. There's no reference to Indian tribes there. This is called the treaty clause of the constitution. And also, as you probably know, the supremacy clause of the constitution. Fed law is supreme. Fed law that is the constitution, the laws that Congress enacts, and all treaties made or which shall be made. This is a reference, a past tense reference to the Indian treaties that tribes like my own, the Shawnee people, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Chickasaw had signed with the United States 
in its two earliest forms of government. Don't forget, we're literally in our third form of federal government, folks. There was the Articles of Confederation Congress from 1781 to 1789. And before that, the Continental Congress was our national government. Those governments signed treaties with tribes. And that reference there is to those treaties, ratifying them and reincorporating them as the supreme law of the land in the United States. Uh, Jude, of course, the Warm Springs tribe signed a treaty with the United States. The fraudulent 1856 treaty I see was literally struck down by Congress and the president signed a bill like yesterday or something. Next point, uh, Jude. These are the three fundamental principles of federal Indian law as set out by the United States Supreme Court. And what I want to focus you on is the third one, the duty. And I only have one more slide. It, the duty of the United States in this Warm Springs situation and this water situation that is unbelievable. The United States is considered to be the trustee of Indian nations and Indian peoples, and it has voluntarily taken on this duty, not, not just through the treaties that were signed, but through basic principles of law that when one entity claims such power over someone else, law requires a or defines a fiduciary duty in which that powerful person is required to look out for the best interests of the weaker party. So look at point number one, Congress claims plenary power over Indian affairs and Indian tribes and Indian peoples as citizens of their governments. And so that leads to the trust relationship. And one more slide, Jude, I think this is my last slide, folks. This is a very significant US Supreme Court case from 1942. Congress exercises this power over Indian nations and Indian peoples and thus has imposed on itself moral obligations of the highest responsibility and trust. And we must judge its dealings by the most exacting fiduciary standards. When the Warm Springs people are without water, I have some friends who live there, porta potties at the end of their driveway, having to go to someone else's house to shower. The things that are going on are unbelievable in the United States, folks, a first world country. There is a duty on the United States, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Health Service to be involved. I worked for the Northern Cheyenne tribe for several years in their housing uh, department. And it took years, but finally the Indian Health Service put in new water to one of the five towns on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. So where is the federal government? And, and that's what's gonna be talked about today by other folks who know this issue better than I do. But where's the federal government in working on these infrastructure issues at, Nor at Warm Springs that's making life almost impossible? But I was asked by Sea Autumn to also talk about, well, there's obviously a second government involved here too, isn't it? the Warm Springs Nation. It also owes a duty to its citizens to do everything within its power to correct this problem. A long-standing problem, a well-known problem. And so I guess I could flip this a little bit. How much pressure has the Warm Springs government been putting on the United States for the past decade or two decades to work on infrastructure issues? I know Louis Pitt's going to speak right after me. So there's a bit of a burden on the tribal government to both force the United States to carry out its obligations and then for the tribal government to do whatever it can to solve this most basic of life's problems. I have no idea if that was 15 minutes, but see, Autumn, that was 200 years of federal Indian law. I mean, it looks like I have about five minutes. Do you, uh, I need more slides. No, we can we can go ahead and pull these down. Um, thanks for doing that. Uh, as you can see, this is a really complicated issue. Um, and I think the other thing that Bob um, didn't mention, which is also a consideration, right, um, is that um, Warm Springs tribal citizens are also citizens of the state of Oregon. And so there's, I think, not only uh, a, a it's more than a dual responsibility to meet the needs of um, of the folks who are who are living at on the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Indian Reservation in Oregon. Um, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, you know, one thing I forgot to mention is if folks have questions, um, you can drop them into the chat, um, or you can send them directly to Dana Zeldua, 
who is our staff person who is compiling questions um, for, for our speakers. Um, so Louis, we'll just move on to our, our next person um, who, who is here to speak, or there you go, or you can email them to Dana at mrgf.org. That's Dana at mrgf.org. Um, we're joined today, Louis Pitt had another engagement that he had to attend to, but we're also joined today by Travis Wells, who's the general manager branch of public utilities. Um, he's going to be um, filling in for Louis, who um, needed to be taken away for um, other duties. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Travis um, to provide us with a bit of an update uh, regarding how things are how things are going um, from the tribal govern government side um, regarding uh, the water crisis at Warm Springs. Travis? Um, just so you know, I, I do see Louie is actually on the call. He's uh, the 777-1359 uh, number. So if he wants to pick up his spot, that's fine, well, if not. Can, can you hear me, Travis? Yeah. Okay. Hey, well, thank you, Travis. Yeah, we'd like to hear your report. Uh, you know, Travis <clears throat> is uh, giving um, reports uh, to us along the way. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Louis Pitt Jr. I'm uh, Director of Government Affairs and Planning, and uh, I work with Salem and uh, just monitor the feds to, um, again, we have a continual push to um, have the United States live up to its obligation and its word to do a whole number of things. And um, so water was one of those. And uh, when um, the, these crises start happening, uh, Alyssa was there as our operations officer. And uh, yeah, it all kind of crashed on us. And I think um, part of the problem was, is that uh, you know, um, not really, uh, keeping up with governance to governance, which is uh, maintaining what you have and uh, replacing what you need to replace. And um, we um, needed to put the partner with the feds on that. And just recently, we've um, uh, been able to, uh, I think, get understanding more so than anything from the state. And that's been proven by uh, uh, some uh, $7.8 million in total that we did get from them. I have no qualms when I go to Salem, since it's uh, you know, the, the 10 million acres that we gave to the United States, that half is definitely in, given to the state in asking for money and asking for help. So um, we, uh, Chairman Green at the time, Austin Green and Michelle, uh, we went to uh, Salem and we asked for a big chunk of change, 43 million, which would be a good start. And out of that, we did get the 7.8 million. So their big question at the time was, where are the feds? What happened to your treaty? And so then I, of course, I told them that we have a list of things that the feds have fallen down on over the years. And that's just throughout the nation, we're not alone on that, but we have our needs. And uh, I appreciate, uh, I think, uh, Alyssa's work in the past to really um, uh, you know, break the ice on the bad news and working real hard, getting things into place. And Travis just stepping up to, um, I think, uh, do the engineering that we have that, uh, and then the managing after that point that we have to have. And uh, so, again, I'm uh, uh, trying to keep in my bounds, which is uh, trying to work with the legislators of, um, uh, I think just recently, too, I've heard uh, uh, the good, good news. Nothing's really happened yet on infrastructure on the federal level through Merkley and uh, Wyden. So we, uh, we're, I'm just waiting to see what's going to happen on that front. So it's appreciated. Good words right now. Hopefully some action. And. We have a, a big bill that we really need to um, work with at Warm Springs, as well as I've heard of all of rural Oregon, they have this very similar situation. So Travis, I'll turn it over to you and uh, please give your report. Um, 
I'll try to keep it as brief as I can to stay within our time frame. Uh, again, for those of you uh, that hadn't caught it before, um, my name is Travis Wells. Uh, I am the uh, Branch of Public Utilities General Manager. I'm also a member of the Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs. So uh, there's some interest for me being my home and uh, also to be uh, doing what I can to help out our people. Uh, but <clears throat> right now, currently, we uh, are slowly getting uh, a handle on some of these issues, the major issues. Uh, back when Alyssa was working with us, we had uh, a lot more significant issues to deal with, uh, with the help of uh, some of them with the funds from Indian Health Service, uh, the state through the E-Fund, uh, and, and uh Obviously, the tribe's own own funding. So, what little funding we do have, uh, we're able to get uh, a handle on uh, the situation to the point where we can now make sure that folks have access to water. Uh, we still don't have the capacity that we need to have, um, but we do have uh, uh, concerns right now with uh, making sure that uh, come summertime that we have capacity and so we're working towards getting those things fixed as well. Um, currently right now we are <clears throat> working on um, the uh, administrative order of consent and the emergency fund that has been imposed on the tribe by the EPA folks. Uh, that's been uh, quite a challenge uh, but uh, <clears throat> we do have currently a project manager on board that works with me and uh, so we're addressing those issues are starting to address those issues currently so uh, but those 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 fixes there we're talking probably in the three and a half to four million dollar range um, and we are constantly looking for grants we're constantly looking for help from the government uh, which unfortunately has been our biggest challenges to get the, the bureau of Indian affairs ihs and uh, the epa folks to kind of uh, step to the plate, so to speak, uh, especially with EPA imposing uh, their orders of consent and also their emergency fund on the tribe, but uh, not willing to uh, come forward and help out with some of those, those funds needed to address these issues. So um, we also are working on our distribution system. Uh, we've had some issues in the past with uh, uh, the system itself just being antiquated. Uh, the distribution system was built in the mid seven late late mid to late seventies, and then the water treatment plant was built in the early eighties, and then came online was came online in, in that, at that point in time. So we're currently working with a system that's forty plus years old at this point. Um, so the maintenance is is kind of a big issue, but also the uh, uh, the the help to get these things funded to bring them online and uh, bring them up to date is, is our current challenge. Um, I can leave it at that. And if there's other additional questions, I can answer those. Uh, I'd like to also let people know that, uh, you know, from my perspective as a branch of public utilities general manager, uh, I do thank those that have contributed to this fund. Um, we have a long way to go. So, uh, but all the funds that we do get uh, will be 100% uh, utilized in, in getting us to the point where we used to be able to run our, our water plant uh, when it first came online. So, again, thank you to those folks that are here that have contributed. Uh, and then also I'll stay online to answer any questions at the end. Great, thanks. We appreciate that. Uh, both Travis and Louis. Um, Travis mentioned um, our, our Chush Fund um, our, that's held uh, on behalf of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs at uh, MRG Foundation. I dropped the um, link in the chat just before, um, since August of 2019, um, since we have uh, entered into an MOU agreement with the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, uh, MRG Foundation has been able to um, raise and transfer 
almost uh, half a million dollars to the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs for immediate relief. Um, that those transfers are done um, weekly, and I mean, sorry, monthly um, on a monthly basis. Um, so uh, each each dollar that raise that is raised um, goes um, directly for uh, immediate relief for the tribe. Um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Marissa Ahern with um, Warm Springs Community Action Team. And um, she's gonna talk a little bit about um, how um, this is impacting uh, communities on the ground. And I think she has a few slides. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll introduce myself with the slides are getting loaded, but my name is Marissa Ahern. I'm a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, um, founder of Native Roots Design, and have worked with the Community Action Team since 2018 as the project manager for the Commissary Project. Um, and today I'm going to kind of talk about how infrastructure is in, impacting the community um, on a number of different levels, but particularly um, the, the lack of infrastructure and the, and the impact that's having on the community when it comes to economic development um, and development as a whole. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so to start, the Community Action Team is a nonprofit located on the reservation in Warm Springs. And the organization is really focused on um, community development and focusing on economic development within the reservation. There's three kind of main pillars to the community action team um, that focuses on asset building, small business promotion, and education for personal and professional development. Um, a major focus of the work that we do is around economic development really at that community level and working with local um, entrepreneurs. And this commissary project um, is a, a big kind of foundation piece to the, to the future of the community action team, um, but it's very much impacted by the infrastructure and what's happening um, in Warm Springs currently. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, an overview of the project is that we are moving and restoring the oldest building on the reservation and turning it into a small business incubator to serve tribal entrepreneurs. Um, upon completion, it will provide retail and co-working space, a food truck pod and commercial kitchen, um, and really create this community gathering space for both community members and visitors to Warm Springs. Um, the goal is that the entire site will be net zero. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, a little bit of history, um, it, which I think really highlights the importance of infrastructure as being a foundation for development. So the commissary building itself, um, you, you can see, has a long history as a part of the tribe's larger plan for development. So the going back all the way to 2005, there's been specific plans to move this commissary building. Going back to 2012, there's been specific plans to create a small business incubator. And in 2020, we're still working to make that happen. A lot of that is due to um, you know, the need for this infrastructure to be in place before these projects can happen in this downtown area. So when you look at the history of this campus area where the commissary is located, you know, it's some of the original infrastructure that was laid um, that is in need of significant um, improvements in order for any type of development in this downtown area for a, a business district to be created. If you can move to the next slide. So I want to kind of start with talking about some of the design for this project. So in moving and restoring this building on the campus area in Warm Springs, we need to plug in to the infrastructure. Um, so these water closure are the, um, the lack of infrastructure and water, you know, is really an important factor for us as we consider building um, and new construction, making sure that there's the infrastructure for us to be able to, to plug into. So the community action team has partnered with a number of different 
designers and engineers to really look at how we can move and restore this building, create um, a space that can really set a new precedent for what's possible when it comes to development on the reservation. So if you go to the next slide. So we've spent a lot of time looking at how this commissary project can really set, um, be the first project in developing this downtown area of Warm Springs for economic development with a big focus on supporting tribally owned businesses and small businesses and entrepreneurs. So we've looked at in, in terms of infrastructure, how this ties into connecting with the region. So how does public transportation fit into this? How are we gonna support the thousands of cars that are driving through the reservation and provide a space where they can stop and support our economy um, and support these businesses? We're looking at in the feedback that the community action team has gathered from working with entrepreneurs we're planning to have a food truck pod. So we have to look at how, what is the infrastructure for that going to look like. You go to the next slide. Um, inside the physical commissary building, you know, we're gonna provide a retail space, a cafe, a commercial kitchen, um, co-working space. And this is the first uh, new construction and development in this downtown area. And so, us really figuring out how this fits into this existing infrastructure problem um, ha has been a big challenge. So if you go to the next slide. With all of that, a big focus of what we're doing is really focusing on how we can be self-sufficient within the site for the commissary. So we're exploring how, how can we make this commissary project in the site as a whole net zero so that it can support itself and so that we can you know, work alongside the tribe in this larger downtown development and as the tribe updates infrastructure to be able to support and set this new precedent for what's possible. So everything from rainwater collection systems to gray water disposal from the food trucks or the public restrooms and how we can really look at laying a new foundation and a new infrastructure for this project to, to be possible and to really um, you know, start this new chapter for the community in as we look to develop this downtown, update the infrastructure and really push for economic development. You can go to the next slide. The major kind of three goals and impact areas that this commissary is trying to address is promoting authentic placemaking, creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem and increasing autonomy and resiliency, particularly when it comes to community members and working with tribal entrepreneurs specifically. And what I think that this really highlights is that, you know, this infrastructure issues and, and the water, um, the, the need is so great. And I think, you know, something that, that needs to be highlighted and, and adds to the urgency of this issue is that before any development, including this commissary can take place, we, we need that infrastructure available for, a, for development to occur. So both from a design and a community and economic development stance, this is the in updating the tribe's infrastructure is really a first step before any development can take place on the reservation. And so I think it's really important to highlight that, um, you know, the importance of the work of the, MRG Foundation and this partnership to be able to raise these funds to improve the tribe's infrastructure and really lay this foundation of just putting the, the basic infrastructure in place in order for development to happen moving forward. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so I'll, I'll be available. The executive director, Chris Watson, is also on this call. So during the question and answer period, he will also be available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Marissa. Um, I want to invite, um, uh, thanks to everyone again for um, your questions along the way. Um, please 
uh, drop them into the chat to Dana Zaldua. She's one of the hosts of the webinar um, and we'll be sure to um, get to them. I'll be asking those questions. There she is. Um, and before we move to um, Q&A, uh, I'd love to invite um, Alyssa Macy just to, to um, say a few words. Alyssa is um, uh, the former um, Chief Operating Officer of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. And um, she's um, here today in her personal capacity as a tribal citizen. Um, and uh, however, she has um, lots of knowledge of the situation, um, having worked at the tribe for many years, um, still having family at the tribe, um, and was um, our, at MRG, our, our main point of contact um, for setting up uh, the Chush Fund. Um, Alyssa? Thank you, Sea Autumn, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you are all doing well. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Alyssa Macy, and I'm a citizen of Warm Springs. Um, I am calling in today from Seattle. I work here uh, in the, uh, the, the occupied territories of the Duwamish Nation, so it's really great to, to be a part of this. Um, I'm here in a personal capacity today, but I have been doing some work behind the scenes with MRG to help set up um, this call and to do some work just to continue to bring forward the issues that Warm Springs is facing. You know, last year in 2019, when the tribe um, had a break in our 14 inch main line that crossed the Shatai Creek, there were a number of boil water notices that were issued. Um, the one that had, was the longest was 76 days. And Seattam and I have had many one-on-one -on -one conversations and I've had this conversation with lots of other people. Would there be other communities in the state of Oregon that would be on a boil water notice for 76 days? What resources would be moved? What mountains would be moved to make sure that a community is not impacted in that way? When we talk about the boil water notice and all of the time that it took to make the necessary repairs to the water distribution system, we had many, many homes that did not have water. There was no water pressure. There was no potable water to drink. There was no, there was no toilets to be flushed. There was no animals to be watered. There was nothing. And to, 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 to know that your, that your community is going through that and you, and you feel alone is a really challenging thing for, for any community to face. And so we were really lucky that we um, were able to, you know, sort of mobilize right away to start working on these issues and to really put in a lot of work. Um, and I, I want to recognize um, Travis and his leadership um, and his dedication, not only as the general manager, but as a tribal member. You know, we were all standing there as tribal members, knowing that this water issue was impacting our families. And I think that was a really difficult thing for us because you want things to be addressed as soon as they can. You want things to be fixed. You want to be able to have um, what is considered a human right is access to clean water. So, you know, it has been um, challenging. It was challenging while I was there. Um, it will continue to be a challenge going forward. Uh, but the one thing that I was really appreciative of is MRG's vision. And, and the vision to work with the tribe in such a way that gave the decision-making power about resources and where those needed to be all allocated to the tribal government, to the people that were closest to the issue, to, um, to honor self-determination in a way that didn't have a bunch of strings attached to it, that didn't say you had to spend it on these five widgets, that allowed the tribe to make decisions based on in time what was happening and what was the need. When you have a major water outage like that, one of the things that we were experiencing, and, and you never think about this because this doesn't happen, is how do you ensure that people have access to toilets um, for 76 days? You know, that is an expensive cost that the tribe had to incur. So those, those are things that we had to think through that most communities don't. But I would say that the, the, the challenges that Warm Springs is facing as it relates to its water and the enormous capital needed to address issues in your infrastructure system is not unusual to us, to, to us as a community. This is a situation that many rural communities are also experiencing. 
So I think that what we experience should be looked at as, as, a, as a lesson of what could go wrong um, and also as a lesson of how partnerships and collaborations can go right. And so I think what, what I experienced during my time there was um, an expansion of how we work with partnerships, um, MRG being one of them, but other foundations, other community groups, and other people, as well as how do we internally grow our own folks to, to step into these leaders, leadership and do the work that needs to be done. I will have to say that um, there, you know, as I said in the beginning, there's the, the community is still facing challenges and the water situation um, and our wastewater situation and other challenges that we face in infrastructure are going to be long-term issues that we're gonna continue to have to address. And in this process, we will need partnership, we will need expertise, and we will need P uh, support from folks like you to amplify the message, to share the information uh, it, I, I think when we talk about um, just the expenses, it's such a mind boggling amount of money that is needed to fix everything, but you break it down into pieces and you tackle the things that are most urgent. So I, I, I just want to give a shout out to, to um, Travis for his great work and also a shout out to Warm Springs Community Action. I was smiling as Marissa was making that presentation because that is the project that they've been working on is so exciting. Um, it is really based in community. It has been born through a lot of input from community members. And so to me, it's like realizing a dream. Like here's this idea that came from the community. Here's this building that's been in the community for a really long time. And what they are doing is breathing life into the dreams of the community. And so infrastructure, the foundation in which this project will sit on is really important. Um, you know, I, I never spent as much time um, in my life, quite honestly, thinking about water and sewer needs as I did working for the tribe. You don't tend to think about it unless it doesn't work. And so um, when it doesn't work, then, you, then, then it's a big deal, right? So the tribe is getting this um, opportunity to really think about it. And, and I know that under Travis's leadership, um, good things will come. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here with us today. I want to thank uh, Seattle and MRG for the relationship that was developed in 2019 around the Chush Fund. Uh, one of the things, one of the outcomes that is probably not listed uh, anywhere in a document, but is something that we have talked about is everybody will know what Chush means. Um, which is really excited. <laughs> Everybody knows what that means. It now auto corrects on my computer. So even my computer knows what chush means. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing that has come out of this, but we are greatly appreciative of your support. And I ask that you um, continue to amplify the need. This is a long-term need um, and continue to check in on the community. There has been um, some really great things that are happening there. And, and while, while times are tough, we are resilient people. And we've been resilient people. And there is a lot of brilliance in my own community of Warm Springs. And there's a lot of brilliance in Indian country. So I am confident that moving forward, we will make the progress necessary. I am confident and excited about Warm Springs Community Action Team's uh, amazing project that they're working on. And I just ask that if you're able to today to support the MRG Foundation's Chush Fund, um, those funds are critical to the work that we're doing in Warm Springs. Um, and have really been able to, to cover the expenses related to everything that could possibly happen when you don't have water for 76 days. You would be amazed at the amount of things that, uh, the amount of costs that you incur in that process. So we just really appreciate um, your support. And as a Warm Springs tribal member, I am so thankful for all of the great work that so many people are doing to, to help uh, my community uh, stabilize and, and to grow. So thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, I just want to lift up um, something which you mentioned. Um, you know, this group um, and this webinar didn't come about by accident. And um, it came about because um, there are a number of conservation focused and minded organizations who came together to, um, to lift this issue up, um, to think critically about, you know, what is our role as a um, as, a, as a body politic in um, caring, for our, caring for our own community members. 
Um, so I just wanna lift up those organizations that came together initially um, to think about this um, and, and um, push this kind of week long um, giving and awareness building campaign. Um, they include uh, the Blue Mountain Land Trust, Columbia Land Trust, Columbia Riverkeeper, Deschutes Land Trust, Friends of the Columbia Gorge, the Nature, Nature Conservancy of Oregon, and Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, and many more keep coming um, online in support of this, including um, Warm Springs Community Action. So I have a list of questions um, here that I'm gonna um, start into. And again, just a reminder to, um, to either email or, um, or uh, chat your questions to Dana Zaldua. Um, this first question I think is um, in, in uh, Louis's direction, if he's still on. Um, Bob said something about uh, applying pressure. Um, I know nothing about this and I'm curious about what kind of pressure works. Legal um, pressure, political pressure, public pressure, all of the above and what kind of pressure um, has been applied? Louis, are you still on? Hello? Hello? There we go, we can hear you now, yeah. Okay, um, yes, I before COVID, um, we developed uh, uh, relationships with the uh, new legislators in the state. Um, Finley was a um, is now our senator, state senator. Uh, Lynn Finley is his name, and he was a representative from that area um, <clears throat> in Eastern Oregon. And then Daniel Bonham came on board, and we were fortunate to have uh, um, like four hours with him on two town halls, which is uh, there's nothing. <laughs> that can replace face-to-face -face time. And so he got uh, an education that was second to none about um, who Warm Springs is. And um, so he took the time to actually come to Warm Springs a number of times. Ongoing relations over the years with um, Senator Wyden and um, also with um, uh, Jeff Merkley, who we worked with at Salem. So those years, decades really, devoted uh, to um, this relationship building as uh, the late Ken Smith had uh, wanted me to do. We need to step it up, Louis. We, those people don't know who we are, is um, what he said, something along those lines. And uh, so um, then too, my job recently has been just to work with local staff to keep them up to speed. They're the real key on getting a, a real quick response from uh, a senator or a congressman or a state legislator. So the um, pressure recently has been really difficult because of COVID. And uh, I'm spending a lot of time just sending uh, notes in of support, oh, good move, I like what you did, or this is a week because of this reason. To keep the uh, communications open uh, is really a challenge these days. And we all have to learn how to do COVID now, uh, communications, just recently, um, Tribal Council, um, um, you know, being responsible, I think the Constitution says the best interest of the tribe. We are not going to have an in-person public budget meeting because of COVID. The lives are important. And again, that just shows, I think, that leadership that's really needed to uh, um, really lead our community. So we're going to continue. I'm going to. I'm trying to figure out some way to have a successor, somebody that's able to step in. And uh, Lord willing, I think at some point COVID will have a vaccine, and we can get more normalcy and more in person. And uh, nothing is uh, can replace a face to face meeting with uh, some good handouts as. Uh, you guys have done with the computer is um, to, to really educate folks about who we are. We're not a minority, we're a distinct political entity. Well, what is that? And uh, so anyway, it just starts with that kind of discussion. So what are we doing? Just about everything we can these days to try to uh, keep in the know, with uh, keep them in the know about who we are and our needs. And so, as Travis has uh, said, is that there's a lot of um, 
trying to play catch up right now, but it's um it's um, the whole United States is in an infrastructure crisis, and um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna get worse all around us as well as the COVID numbers going up is. Um, this is getting kind of rugged to be anybody, not just the Indian on the Indian reservation, where we're half funded by everybody. IHS, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, is um, there's there's a a study called um, Breaking Broken Promises, and previous to that, it was called the Quiet Crisis, that really talks to the um, total lack of funding as almost the institutional policy of the United States towards. Indian country, Indian nations in the United States. So it's um, almost almost a kind of unwritten policy. Well, we'd like to change that. Okay, that's all I have on that. We're doing everything we can. Great, thanks, Louis. Um, one question for Chris and Marissa that has come in. Um, I would love to know how can how we can support the commissary project and help the larger Central Oregon community know what. Um, know that it's happening. Marissa, do you want to take that? Sure. <laughs> um, the commissary is actually launching a website on uh, November 10th. Um, so we are happy to share that. It'll be warmspringscommissary.org. Um, but it will go live on November 10th and all information on how to support the project and updates on everything will be shared there. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that there's a few donors uh, who've donated to the project in this call. Um, thus far, we've received $1.1 million in capital uh, to do this project towards renovating and moving the old commissary building. We haven't received funding yet for our food cart pod, uh, nor the commercial kitchen or some of the other um, things like bathrooms off the highway, pavilion, et cetera, that we're interested in putting on that site. But we're moving along, having good communication with different funders, private foundations, the state and federal. A little bit of good news recently is that we got a federal grant, which will pay Marissa for the next three years to continue being the project manager. Uh, I'm really happy with that. And to um, enable us to continue moving forward with all the design components of the project. And also that grant provided us with two more food carts. So we have three now. So we're, we're on we're on target to make this thing happen. It's gonna take a little bit of time. Um, one thing I did wanna say um, about, just to give a little background information, uh, not answering this question exactly, but talking about uh, business on the reservation, um, there's only 13 retail businesses on the Warm Springs Reservation. Um, compare that to the, and there's 5,000 people on the reservation, compare that to the nearby town of Madras, which has a little over 7,000 people, and there's over 400 retail businesses. Um, the Warm Springs economy, uh, private economy that is, provides 150 to 200 jobs for community members, and it's probably about 1,000 that are needed to strengthen the economy and put it where it needs to be and deal with the very high unemployment rate on the reservation. So that's why a little nonprofit like us is trying to develop a site and to add retail businesses and office space and co-working space and food carts. Our project will effectively potentially double the number of retail businesses on the reservation, which um, I think is pretty remarkable, but there's a long way to go. So imagine, um, what it will take, I mean, if we can build this water infrastructure, um, you know, get the water delivery systems in place, it is only when that happens that we'll be able to develop the small business economy to the extent that Madras is developed. We don't think of, of Madras as being an economic juggernaut or anything like that. So let's see if we can get Warm Springs, you know, partway there. So that, that's, that's what we're doing at Community Action Team. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question, um, again, it's for Louis. Um, for folks who may have capacity to support local and national advocacy efforts, what's the best way to stay in the loop? Well, um, I guess, uh, for me, the, I just have to monitor all the news of uh, there's some great communications dealing with um, 
Indian Country, Indian Z. Um, there's what Turtle News. Um, General News is uh, for me is really a godsend. Is that I can keep an eye on things and give people calls and then uh, you know firm up information about who they are and then who can you call directly. So that's that's what I do. I have to get a name inside some organization so I know what's really going on there. So um, it takes time to um, develop a relationship with any one of the tribes. So I just always uh, stress to people they get to know the tribe, one or two people on the inside, but like a, a Travis or a, a Louis, my job is to uh, keep an eye on things that... Uh, if you have problems with getting to uh, getting the facts that uh, can help you, is that that's part of my job. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's uh, organizations like uh, you know the people that do take the time to develop relations. Um, the McKinsey Gathering is one of those that have been around for a long time that I appreciate, and uh, Potlatch is another one who really um, keeps an eye on things and um, knows uh, what's uh, how to work with tribes, not work against them. And um, uh, you really have to be cautious sometimes with tribes because uh, um, there's a lot of politicking going on. So you really have to be respective of that. So, uh, yeah, I uh, again, I, I do a, a whole lot of uh, time on the computer these days, uh, contrary to what uh, I used to do in the past, is that it's, uh, well, you can really cut through a lot of time with um you know how to get around in the news. Great, hey. thank you. Thank you, Louis. Um, also in the chat, there are some um, resources that Louis was talking about. We put a, dropped a link to the Potlatch Fund and also added a link um, for KWSO. Um, KWSO is the um, radio station on the Warm Springs Reservation um, and, and they're the first to know usually um, when there's a um, boil water notice, when, um, when there's something happening in, in the community um, related to um, infrastructure issues. Um, and it's where a lot of public notices go. So um, if you wanna keep up to date what's happening, um, I would uh, favorite KWSO um, to keep yourself informed. Um, one last question before we close out. Um, and um, that is, um, how can journalists do a better job of covering Warm Springs water issues? Um, and either um, I think Louis or uh, Alyssa, um, uh, maybe Alyssa, will we go to you first? Um, and thinking about um, uh, what has transpired over the last couple of years, um, what advice do you have? Did we lose Alyssa? Oh, here I am. I, I thought I was waiting for you, Louis. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I would just say that uh, good, good relationships, um, relationships to begin with, um, are really important. And I think the one thing uh, that I think is very challenging for journalists is um, showing up and not understanding the larger context of what is happening in the community. So our issues are complex and they are tied into many other um, issues, including a very long history with the federal government that has not always that has not been in uh, in in good relation with tribal nations. So I think when you are reporting from tribal communities, um, my preference always is to have people from the community lead with their stories. Um, I also really am excited about efforts like Indian Country Today and the large number of Indian journalists across the country that are telling stories in tribal communities, with tribal communities, in partnership with tribal communities, and can understand the historical context of, of which these situations are incur incurring in. Um, you know, there are times where I feel like news will cover things from a very deficit place, um, failing to recognize that there is an incredible amount of intelligence, um, dedication, and hard work going on in community um, that folks don't know about. And I think that really boils down to the strength of the relationships that you have with tribal leadership, 
um, the relationships you have with communities. So I encourage folks that are interested in, in working with the tribe. Um, there is a process for doing that. Um, they All of our media inquiry, at least when I was there, were going through the secretary treasurer's office. So there's a process for going through that. If you want to get an official statement from the tribe, um, I encourage you to work through those processes. Uh, and, and that will, you know, at least when I was there, we, we tried to be very respectful of that process. Um, but again, this just boils down to, to the relationships and the strength and depth of relationships you have with um, not only elected officials, but community members. Yes, I agree with that. It's um, the, just um, the basics of who Indian country is. Uh, Warm Springs is a whole lot of things, not just a community. I said distinct political entity. What is that? We gave 10 million acres to the United States. 100% um, of Jefferson County was given by the uh, through treaty, and um, people don't know that. And then uh, we oh we get uh, free money from the federal government. Excuse me. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, just uh, basic facts that have to be uh, given out there with. Um, I think, uh, and I, I'm old enough to where I've seen a changeover of landowners too out there that uh, the old timers used to allow our folks to, to use their land because that's what they've always done. And as things change, we need to um, re-up, I think, the messaging to uh, our neighbors all the time, uh, letting them know who we are factually. And then that relationship building is really important too, is that uh, it's real challenge these days with all the things we have and in and out of the office because of COVID to uh, return calls timely. But um, um, uh, the reporters do like to be respected and that's hard to do these days. We had fire, water and COVID going on. Wow, it was really something just to try to stay connected to the office. All right, okay, I guess that's realized uh, the immediate challenges that Indian country has depending on the situation. So be respective of that. Don't um, press people tend to want to get their story out. They got a deadline and uh, got to be respective of who you're trying to get the story from. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks, Louis. Well, we're a couple minutes over, so I'd love to just um, close us out. Um, and something that Louis just said reminded me of something that um, an old friend uh, and colleague used to say is that um, tribal communities work on different timescales. And so to have um, something like this, um, you know, this has just been the, the last few hundred years that we've at out west have been living under these conditions um, um, where we've been dispossessed of our wealth, where, where we live in extractive economies and um, that uh, things like the commissary project, things um, that have um, long-term vision of how do we call into existence um, the tribal nations of the future and what kind of economies and um, uh, systems and infrastructures do, do we need to, that we need to support those communities, um, ones that are green, ones that are um, really um, hold and carry our values forward. Um, I wanted to just turn it over to Alyssa for any um, last words as we sign off. I'm doing the infamous talking with my uh, on mute. <laughs> we all do it once in a while, right? Um, first of all, again, thank you, MRG. Uh, this relationship that Warm Springs has with the foundation is the first of a kind partnership between a foundation and a tribal nation. And um, I'm really thankful to MRG's efforts for setting this up and working with the tribe to do that, as well as being a steward of the funds um, generated from folks like yourself uh, and folks all over the country to help repair and restore and, and stabilize the water infrastructure in the community of Warm Springs. Um, these are the type of relationships that I hope that other foundations will think about um, and to work towards, again, allowing and, and respecting tribal sovereignty and self-determination for tribal nations to make the decisions that are based in their own experience, are guided by cultural values, and really coming from a place of community. 
And that is really, really important, especially in an issue like this. I also want to thank the partners who have come together from the environmental community in the state of Oregon for stepping up to amplify the messages um, that we have from the community to spur donations to the Chush Fund because at the, at the end of the day, we still need to raise dollars to continue to support the, the water infrastructure needs in the community of Warm Springs. So that's first and foremost how you can help. Um, I would encourage you if you are donating to use the direct link to the Chush Fund. The reason for that is social media platforms take a long time to transfer money. Um, but if you, if you donate through MRG Foundation, uh, they are, are transferring dollars directly to the tribe on a monthly basis. So that's really great that that can be done uh, quickly uh, in, to the tribe. We are also a uh, part of this campaign that we've been working on is to increase the public awareness of what's happening in Warm Springs and to draw the greater public into this critical issue. Again, the one thing that I always ask myself, if another community in Central Oregon was on 76 days of a boil water notice, and in many of those days without water, what mountains would have been moved to make sure that this wasn't occurring? So we want folks to know what's going on in the community, um, again, because we need folks to know, and, and, and we appreciate all the donations that have happened um, for my community of Warm Springs. Thank you so much for doing that. And finally, um, we wanna generate letters of support from folks like yourself uh, to Senators Wyden and Merkley for their long-term legislative fixes. And MRG is gonna send out a follow-up email at the end of this call, and it will list ways that you can get involved. But I just wanna say thank you so much to MRG for all of the work that you're doing. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And just a super shout out and lots of love to all of the Warm Springs tribal members that are on the call. Um, you know, I'm so appreciative of all the work that's going on there, and I am so excited about the commissary project. This was something that, uh, while I was working for the tribe, was, was, you know, being dreamed up and thought about and talked about, and, and it's just making some incredible progress. So there is, like I said before, so much brilliance in my community. Um, there are so many dedicated folks doing really great work, and there are incredible stories to be told. Um, so just encourage you to stay connected with us. Uh, we dropped in the chat the KWSO and the Spilei Taimu links. Um, they are super active on social media. So if you want to know what's happening in Warm Springs, they're your go-to places. So I encourage you to connect. And again, um, thank you, Seattle, for your leadership. Just really appreciate it. Um, and MRG for everything you're doing and all of the Oregon environmental partners who have stepped up today, stepped up in the past couple of weeks, stepped up before to really make sure that the state of Oregon um, and the folks in the state of Oregon and in this region are aware of what's happening right in your own backyard. So just really appreciate all the great work from everybody. Thanks everyone. Um, have a great day and be looking for an email from us uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.